uh, Sally Plum Clayton Hello. and Ed Stivender. It turns out that um, I met them both in the early 1980s at festivals, and these are two of my beloved storyteller friends, like childhood friends, actually. <laughs> And um, so it's my delight to introduce a poem who's going to tell one of the classic Anderson stories. Pom Clayton is a wonderful and very <laughs> devoted storyteller. I mean, I would trust Pom with any story. She has been doing some remarkable and interesting one woman shows throughout the world, particularly in Europe and the UK. And she's written many wonderful children's books that are well worth your seeking. And uh, Simon's going to put up a banner of the newest book that Pom just wrote, which is absolutely beautiful, The Phoenix of Persia. And it is just so wonderful to introduce and share with you, Sally Pom Clayton. Thank you so much, Laura. Well, it really is an honor to be under the virtual statue and when Laura asked me to, to tell a story of Hans Christian Andersen, I found my book that I had in the 60s as a child. And the illustrator of this book, they were twins, two women, Anne and Janet Johnston, and they illustrated many, many fairy tale books. And me and my sister used to copy them because they had beautiful costumes. There were many fairies. And I looked at The Little Mermaid and I remembered that we were frightened of this page. And there is, I can't, yes, there I can show it to you, The Sea Witch. And we almost didn't like turning over the page because perhaps the sea witch's magic would come out of the book and reach us. And as I turned the pages, something fell out of the book. Once upon a time, a long time ago, far, far out to sea, as Hans Christian Andersen wrote, where the sea is as blue as cornflower and clear as glass, it is very deep, so deep that no anchor could ever reach the bottom. And in that deep place, the mer folk live. Down there is the Sea King's palace. It has walls made of corals, windows of mother of pearl, and a roof made of mussel shells that open and close with the tides. Everything is covered with a hazy blue light so that you might think that you were on land with a blue sky above you, not deep down at the bottom of the sea. The Sea King had six daughters, all mermaids with lovely fishes' tails. Their mother had died when the youngest, littlest mermaid was born. And so their grandmother had brought them up and she was very grand. She wore a silver crown and 12 oysters pinned to her tail. But she adored her granddaughters, especially the youngest. She couldn't help loving the littlest mermaid the most. Outside the palace, there was a garden with swaying seaweed trees. The mermaids made flower beds in the shape of whales and starfish. The little mermaid made a circle with red shells. It's the sun, she said. I wish I could feel the sun on my skin. The mermaids found strange objects from sunken ships. The little mermaid found a marble statue of a human boy. 
I wish I could talk to humans, she said. Now, girls, said their grandmother, when you are 15, you will be able to rise up out of the water, sit on a rock and sing. Fifteen, said the little mermaid, but that's five years away. Soon it was the eldest sister's turn. She had her 15th birthday. She rose up through the water and when she came back she said, Sisters, I sat on a rock in the moonlight and I combed my hair. Then it was the second sister's turn and she went up and she came back and said, I saw the sun rise. The third sister said, I saw the sun set. The fourth sister, who was very brave, said, I swam to the edge of the sea and I saw children paddling in the pool. The fifth sister, whose birthday was in the winter time, said, I saw icebergs. When they reached 15, they became true mermaids. And so the older girls would rise up together whenever they liked, arm in arm, all in a row. They would sit on rocks and they would comb out the waves in their hair. They would flash their mirrors to attract ships. They would whip their tails in the sea to brew up storms. And then they would sing the sailors under the waves. But the little mermaid could not go with them. La, 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 la. She was left alone, singing to herself at the bottom of the sea. La, 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 la. At last, it was her 15th birthday. Her grandmother said, now you must be dressed properly. And she put a crown of white shells on her head and clipped a single oyster to her tail. Ouch, said the little mermaid, that hurt. Now everyone will know you are a princess. At last, the little mermaid waved goodbye and she swam up. Up, up towards the blue light and she burst through. The air was so fresh and there was a ship. She swam towards it and with the rise and fall of the tide, the swell of the waves, she peeped through a porthole. There was a party inside. There were beautifully dressed people and there was a young man in the centre with curly black hair, dark eyes. He was wearing a golden crown. Everyone kept clapping him on the back, shaking his hand and then they brought him a cake with candles. The little mermaid stared. He is a prince and we share a birthday. The little mermaid gazed at the prince. She felt that she could gaze forever. When a wind rocked the boat, and the little mermaid saw a flash of lightning. A storm was coming. She knew she was supposed to whip her tail up to make the storm worse. She was supposed to sing the sailors under the waves. But I don't want to drown the prince, she said. She thought of the prince dancing and laughing and eating. She just wanted to be with him. The wind rocked the ship. Wind lashed the sails, stripping them into shreds. Waves crashed over the side of the boat. It pitched and rolled. And then a huge wave crashed onto the deck and the mast split in two and Sailors and the young prince were washed out to sea. The little mermaid dove under the ship between broken planks of wood and she caught the prince and she swam with him, rising him up, lifting his head up out of the water. The 
but he was still. He was barely breathing. La, la. The little mermaid began to sing. La, 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 la. Not to drown him, but to keep him alive. He looked just like her marble statue. La, 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 la. La, la. She saw colour, the glow of life, come back into the prince's cheeks. He breathed again, but he didn't open his eyes. La, la, la. Singing and swimming, she sang with the prince, swam with the prince all the way to an island. And she placed him on the beach. And then she heard bells. On the top of a high cliff, there was a building. She heard voices and the little mermaid hid behind a rock. A party of schoolgirls came running down the cliff, all dressed in white, shrieking and laughing. The eldest had long black plaits, rosy cheeks, and she saw the body. She rushed to the prince and she lifted up his head and she put it in her lap. Quick, get help, she cried. The little mermaid watched as the prince opened his eyes and looked into the face of the girl. Thank you, he said. You saved my life. Your singing. It kept me alive. The little mermaid watched. He had no idea that it was she who had saved him. The little mermaid swam back to her father's kingdom. What did you see? said her sisters. The little mermaid said nothing. She returned to the island, but the prince had gone back to his own kingdom. That night, the little mermaid said, Granny, can I live with humans? <laughs> Never, said her grandmother. <laughs> the very thing that is your greatest beauty here under the sea, your tail would be considered hideous up on land. And besides, you'd never be able to walk. After that, the little mermaid wanted to get rid of her tail. She thought of the sea witch. Maybe she could help. The little mermaid set off on a dangerous journey through whirlpools that tried to drag her under, past slimy creatures with squirming tentacles. Her heart pounded with fear. She nearly turned back. She thought of the prince and she continued on until she came to a hut made of bones, arm bones, leg bones, shoulder bones, hip bones, finger bones, toe bones, the bones of shipwrecked men. And inside was the sea witch with green skin, red shining eyes wriggling writhing eels for hair. I know what you want. Legs! And to marry the prince. <laughs> the witch called the little mermaid into her dwelling. I can help you. I will make you a magic potion. Your tail will become legs. When you drink it, you will never be able to be a mermaid again. And every step you take will feel like burning knives. And if the prince does not marry you, your heart will break and you will become foam on the sea. Are you willing? to sacrifice all that? The little mermaid nodded. Yes, but 
inside, she trembled with fear. And she watched as the sea witch took a crystal bottle and she put drops of scarlet, purple, green. She mixed it, smoke swirled and the liquid turned clear. Now, my magic is very expensive. So I want the sweetest thing under the sea. Your voice. Give me your tongue. The little mermaid stuck out her tongue. The witch cut it off and she put the mermaid's tongue inside a sea shell. Now, I have your voice whenever I want it. The little mermaid grabbed the crystal bottle and she swam all the way to the prince's kingdom. At dawn, she drank it down. It was fierce and fiery. She swooned away. And when she woke up, she felt a terrible pain. Her tail had gone. And there were two human legs. And looking down at her was the prince. Maiden, are you all right? Maiden! The little mermaid opened her mouth to speak. But no sound came out. She had lost her voice. I was lost at sea once, said the prince, just like you. A kind soul saved me, and now it is my turn. And the prince picked up the little mermaid and carried her to his palace. The little mermaid was bathed, dressed in fine clothes, dainty shoes. She'd never worn clothes or shoes before. She was given food to eat, bread, cheese. And the prince said, what is your name? Where do you come from? What happened? Where, did, where have you come from? But the little mermaid could not reply. She said nothing. I will call you my foundling, said the prince, because I found you. And after that, the little mermaid went everywhere with the prince and she wanted to do everything that he did. And so she learned to ride a horse. She learned to shoot a bow and arrow. She put on a page's outfit and she went hunting. She pulled on boots and she climbed a mountain. But every step she took felt like burning sharp knives, just as the witch had said. But she said nothing because she wanted to be beside the prince. At night, she would put on a fine dress. And as musicians played, she would rise up onto her toes and dance until her feet bled. When the whole palace went to sleep, she would run down the wide marble palace steps to the sea. And she would put her feet into the cool water. One night, she heard singing. She saw her sisters rising up all in a row, singing, calling to her. But the little mermaid could not go. The prince said, my dear foundling, I love you as a sister, as a best friend, as a cousin. But he could not think of making her his queen. One day he said, my sweet foundling, I do wish that it was you who had saved my life. But I must find that girl because I have promised her my heart. And now 
my mother and father are sending me by ship to marry a princess far away. Come with me, my fountain. You could wear a sailor's suit. You could keep me company on board. And so the little mermaid put on a sailor's outfit. She sat on the top deck with the prince and he told her stories about sea monsters, <laughs> mermaids. And the little mermaid smiled. At night, when everyone was asleep, she would look over the edge of the ship. And one time, she was sure that she saw her father's palace with her grandmother standing on the topmost tower, weeping. At last, they arrived in a great city. Bells rang, flags fluttered, and the princess came to greet the prince. She had long black plaits and rosy red cheeks. It's you, said the prince. For you were the one who saved me. How could I forget, said the princess. I was on school on the island and I found you lying on the beach. The prince took her hands. Now I can marry my heart's desire. And then the prince introduced the little mermaid. This is my foundling. I found her as you found me. And she must stay with us forever. The little mermaid curtsied. But inside she felt her heart break just as the witch had said. The little mermaid was dressed in gold for the wedding and she held the bride's train. But all she could think about was becoming foam on the sea. When the party was over, everyone boarded the ship and on the top deck, a royal pavilion had been set up in purple and gold for the bridal couple to sleep in. The bride and groom went inside the magnificent tent and the little mermaid leant over the side of the ship. She heard singing and she saw her sisters rising up all in a row. They looked different. Their lovely, long, curly hair had gone. It had all been cut off. We gave our hair to the witch. Even Granny cut off her hair for you. The witch gave us this knife. She says, stab the prince in his heart. Let his blood fall on your feet and your tail will come back. But you must do it before dawn. Hurry! The little mermaid took the knife and her sisters sank down under the waves. The little mermaid parted the purple and gold tent curtains and inside was the bride with her head asleep on the prince's shoulder. The little mermaid raised the knife she gazed at the prince and she felt that she could gaze forever. I can't kill you, she said. And she ran out of the tent and she hurled the knife out to sea. And then she leapt over the side of the ship and hurled herself into the waves. But she did not dissolve into sea foam because just then the sun rose and the first rays of light fell upon her body filling her with golden warm light and the little mermaid heard singing and high above her in the sky she saw spirits girls with long hair sparkling like bubbles 
bright, shining spirits. They reached down and they caught the little mermaid by the hand and they pulled her up, up into the blue sky. We are the daughters of the air. Your courage and loyalty have made you one of us forever. And the little mermaid found that she was swimming in the blue sky. She didn't need a tail or legs. Sea foam had become air foam. And she was free, swooping and soaring, flying, free as a foamy bubble of air. Down on board ship, and the prince heard that the little mermaid had gone. He let out a terrible cry. And he went to the edge of the ship and saw that the little mermaid sailed above in the blue sky, radiant and bright, no longer looking up at the blue sky but part of it, looking down on everything, forever. And so, if you feel a warm wind on your cheek, if the wind brings you the scent of flowers, if you hear the wind whistling, you will know that the little mermaid is flying overhead. La, 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 la. So I hope you enjoyed that incredible telling by Palm. That was that was remarkable. Um, and I think you're going to be equally enchanted, but in a completely different way, by the gentleman storyteller, Rapscallion and Scallywag, Mr. Ed Stivender. Um, Ed is, uh, he's a, the only word I can use really is sweetheart. And it's meant in the best way possible. He's such a great guy. Um, and he's a, a massive supporter of new storytellers or new, you know, new to the national circuit type of thing. And he is a big supporter of people like that. And I have a great deal of respect and admiration for this fellow. So please give a virtual round of applause to Ed Stivender. <sighs> it's a great honor to uh, do this story, which is in fact called by most people, There is a Difference. It was the month of May. The wind still blew cold, but from bush and tree, from field and flower, came the welcome sound, spring is come. Wildflowers in profusion covered the hedges. Under the little apple tree, spring was busy, telling his tale from a branch that hung fresh and blooming, covered with delicate little pink blossoms, just ready to open. The apple branch, well knew how beautiful it was. This knowledge exists in the leaf as much as in the blood. So it was not surprised, therefore, when a nobleman's carriage in which sat the young countess stopped on the road just by. The countess declared, the apple branch is a most lovely object, an emblem of spring in its most delightful aspect. So the branch was broken off and given to her, and she held it in her delicate hand and sheltered it with her silk parasol. 
Then off to the castle, in which were lofty halls and splendid drawing rooms, pure white curtains fluttered before open windows, and wonderful, beautiful flowers stood in transparent glass vases. And into one of these, which looked as if it had been cut from new-blown snow, the apple branch was placed among some light, fresh twigs of beech. It was a charming sight. Then the apple branch became proud, which was a very human thing to do. People of every description entered the room and according to their position in society, so dared they to express their admiration. Some few said nothing, others expressed too much and the apple branch soon came to understand that there was as much difference in the characters of human beings as there was in that of plants and animals. Some were born to be beautiful, others to be useful, and still others we could very well do without. So thought the apple branch as it stood at the open window over which it could see over gardens and fields in which there were flowers and plants enough to think and reflect upon. Poor, Despised herbs, said the apple branch. There really is a difference between them and such as I am. How unhappy they must be if they can feel as those in my position do. And the apple branch looked with a sort of pity on them, especially on a particular yellow flower that grew in fields and in ditches. No one ever gathered it for a, a nosegay. It was too common. And uh, it was even known to spring up between the paving stones, shooting up everywhere like bad weeds. And in Denmark, it had these dandelions, very ugly name of the devil's milk bucket. Poor despised plants. It is not your fault that you are so ugly and have such an ugly name, but it is as among humans there must be a difference. A difference, said the sunbeam as it kissed the yellow flowers in the field and kissed the apple branch. All were brothers, and the sunbeam kissed them all, poor flowers as well as rich. The apple branch had never thought of the boundless love of God that extends over all the fabrics of creation, over every creature that lives and breathes and has its being in him. Had never thought of the good and beautiful that are so often hidden, but can never be forgotten by him, both among the lower orders of creation as among humans. The sunbeam, that ray of light, knew better. You do not see very far, nor very clearly. Which of the despised plants do you most especially pity? The devil's milk bucket the dandelion. No one ever gathers it in a nosegay. It is often trampled underfoot. There are so many of them. And when they run to seed, they have flowers like wool that fly across the road in little pieces and cling to the dresses of the ladies. They are only weeds, and I suppose there must be weeds, but I am so thankful that I am not made like one of them. Presently, there came into the fields a whole group of children, the youngest of which was so tiny it had to be carried by the others. But when he was placed upon the grass amid the yellow flowers, he cried aloud with joy and kicked his legs and rolled around and plucked the flowers and kissed them with childlike innocence. But the elder children, broke off the flowers with long stalks and bent the stalks one to another to form links and so to make chains 
first to go around the neck and then across the shoulders and hang down to the waist and finally a wreath to wear upon the head. They looked quite splendid in their garlands of green stems and golden flowers. But the eldest among them they gathered carefully the faded flowers on the stem of which the seeds were gathered to form a white feathery coronal. These loose airy wool flowers are very beautiful and seem to be made of snowy white feathers or down. The children held them to their mouths and tried to blow away the whole coronal with one puff of breath. They have been told by their grandmothers that whoever did so would be sure to receive new clothes before the end of the year. <laughs> by this, the despised flower was raised to the level of prophet or foreteller of events. <laughs> Do you see? said the sunbeam. Do you see? Do you see how beautiful these flowers are? Do you see their power of giving pleasure? Oh, yes, to children. <laughs> by and by there came into the field an old woman who, with a blunt knife without a handle, dug in around some of the dandelion plants and pulled them up. With some of these, she would make tea for herself. With the others, she would take to the apothecary and sell to obtain a little bit of money. But beauty is of greater value than all of this. Only the chosen ones are invited to enter the realms of the beautiful. Just as in humans, so in plants and flowers, there is a difference, and so there must be, else we would all be equals. Then some people came into the room. Among them, the young countess, who had placed the apple branch in the vase so delightfully under the rays of sunlight. She carried something in her hand that might have been a flower. The object was hidden by two or three large leaves that covered it like a shield so that no puff or gust of wind could, uh, could harm it. And it was carried more carefully than the apple branch had ever been. Very cautiously, the leaves were removed and there appeared the snowy white seed crown of the despised yellow dandelion. This was what the young woman had plucked so carefully and carried home so safely covered so that not one of the little arrows that of which it was the airy likeness was made could blow away. Now she drew it forth quite uninjured and wondered at its beauty and airy likeness and singular construction whereby each seed was free to follow the wind. See, said the countess, see how wonderfully God has made this little flower. I will paint it with the apple branch together. Everyone admires the beauty of the apple branch, but this humble flower has been endowed by heaven with its own kind of loveliness. And although there is a difference in appearance, both are children of the realms of beauty. And the sunbeam kissed the lowly flower, and the sunbeam kissed the blooming apple branch, upon whose leaves there appeared a rosy blush. There is a difference.